<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, let's take a journey into the unknown. that surrounds us presents riding through the unknown with your host Michael Hoffman. Welcome to another exciting of Tetsu, Riding Through the Unknown. I'm your host, Michael, and I am joined today by someone who I had the pleasure to meet and have had a wonderful trip with, and he is a truly wonderful man. There's not much more I could say about that because everybody knows him once I say his name. He who, is who, who are you talking about? Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking about Merlin. No. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, I give you Alexander Collier. <laughs> uh, for the doubters, Michael and I know each other well. His dad and mom are very, very dear friends, and we just lost his dad, sadly very good man and he is sorely missed and michael yes, and i drove from from uh, dallas to seasick last year gsick and uh, home as well uh, from gsick orlando to back to dallas and before i moved on went to colorado so we know each other well and, and michael the you know your intro is awesome you know that may be the best part of the interview <laughs> <laughs> well the interesting thing about the intro is my cousin's son does videos. Uh -huh. And so I said to him, hey, can you make an intro? And I just gave him topics. And he came back and said, here, how about this? And I was like, man, he just knocked it out of the park. <laughs> yeah, it's awesome. It's good. It's really good. You know, I, I would love to learn about all those topics. I know, and my hope is, you know, I had guests in mind that would do that and would, so I was like, yeah, it's like teasers. So what do you want to talk about? Um, cooking, um, house cleaning, <laughs> auto mechanics? Well, I think one thing that people who may not be too familiar with you because i mean you have been talking since 1994 but 
Some people may still be new to your name is, how did you become an Andromedan contactee? <clears throat> well, because they came and chose me. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. It's not like I chose to do it. <clears throat> you know, they just, uh, they got, they came and got me. And the interesting thing is, and, and I've told the story a zillion times, <clears throat> is that I knew who they were. Now, I was just eight years old, but when, when I saw them, when I opened my eyes and saw them, I knew, I knew them. You know, there was just an absolute knowing. And, um, you know, as, as the contacts progressed and I got older, I was, you know, shown more information in regards to uh, past lives. And I, I was shown that I have known these gentlemen uh, many, many lifetimes, uh, mostly as Andromedans or in the Andromedan system, you know, that particular star nation. Uh, I've had other lives in, in other forms and other star systems. You know, I mean, we're, we're ageless. We're, we're just, I don't know that you can actually put a number as to how old our souls are. You know, we go back before the creation of this universe, which we find ourselves in now. Um, we came in as spirits to inhabit this, this universe after it was created. So, you know, it's been, it's been an interesting journey to say the least. I, I can agree to that because in some of your talks, because you do a weekly seminar and Q and A on some of them, I find it really interesting when you talk like almost like first or second person about who you were up talking with just having a normal conversation and this is what they wanted me to share and it's like it's to me it's a really big that you're able to recall everything that's happening up there well they're telepathic and because of that there aren't words <clears throat> There's, I mean, they sound like words, but they're not visible words or uh, auditory words. But what it is, is they project into our, into our heads, my head, concepts, pictures. You know, when I first started getting information to share, <clears throat> and this was when I was young, I was 10 12, maybe. I was so focused on the pictures that I wasn't listening to what they were saying. So they would have to repeat themselves again because I'm like, what? You know, because I'm watching the pictures in my head because they're concepts, they're diagrams, they're holographs. And it's like this, you know, the information is just moving like this because that's how their minds work. It's just, it's this, you know, it's literally this fast. No, I didn't mean you. It's <laughs> Good boy, you come, huh? Yeah. You're in the program. You show up. So uh, you want to say hi? You want to say hi to everybody? Hi, say Merlin. Hi. Hey, look who's, look who's here. Look who's here. There's Michael. Oh, say hello. So Fourth. cute. Fourth. Good boy. Okay. Okay, well, we got to get that down. So that's what it would. Be, that's what it was, and and um, you know sometimes they'd have to repeat themselves. And and the older of the two, Viseus, um, he, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't cool on repeating himself. And I'm sure that's because he had been a teacher for a very very long time for whatever his life lifespan was in Andromeda or fifth density, he had been a teacher. And, uh, and I'm sure that, you know, he's had to repeat himself many, many times, 
even with them. So we're not all that different when you break it down. You know, sometimes we don't, um, you know, we think that they're so different and yet there's so many similarities between the races. They're just, they're just at a very different level. They think differently. They see things differently. Um, they, they understand things in a 360 perspective where we're still learning how to do all that stuff. Um, but you know, they, they look like us, they, they smile, they laugh, they play, the children play, um, they enjoy the camaraderie of each other. You know, if, if there was one thing that stands out, Michael, it's that they have no fear. They have no fear. You simply cannot detect anything like that in their culture from what I've seen of it. So they're always present. They're always authentic. You know, and it's that that quality of always being present that is just an absolute blessing to be around. Because the only thing that exists is the moment. And if you're in their space, because of their energy, their frequency, because of the telepathic communication that's going on with everybody around you, whether it's focused on you or not, you're, you're, you're in that frequency of, uh, of joy, of brotherhood. It's just remarkable. And, and, and it's because of that that there were times I had a really hard time coming back. I just like, you know, nothing's working here. Let me stay. You know, I'll 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 do laundry. I'll sweep the floor of the of the spaceport on the ship. I you know, I'll do latrines. I don't care. Just let me stay. And you know, that wasn't gonna happen. That wasn't gonna happen. So it, it to me it sounds like then they must see potential in us because the way you're describing them and the way we are here, we are like complete opposites. Well, you have to understand that um, there was a time when we were very much like them. I think if we go back to the Sumerian times, to the Chaldean times, um, maybe for a period of time, the Babylonian times, that stretch of time, we lived, we lived in, and it exists and existed with them. They were here on the planet, teaching, uh, mentoring, showing us how to do things. Um, and then something happened. And they left. And then another group came in and taught us, in order to control and manipulate, they taught us fear. They taught us anger. They mirrored all those things that they were teaching us. They then changed all the languages so we wouldn't be able to communicate with each other. They then um, created wars, battles, and they used us as the pawns in their wars. Especially any time that we, um, we may have rebelled or stood up to them and said, no, we're not doing this anymore. There would be a war that would be created so that the, re the rebellion would be squashed because then we would be warring with each other and taking each other out. They knew what they were doing. And what it did was it, it created separation. It created racial prejudices. Um, it created hatred. It created fear, loathing, lack of love, disrespect, all of those things that we now think is normal, these were all learned behaviors that we were taught by very specific groups that have a very low frequency in our galaxy, but are very high technologically. You know, the Orion group would be one, several reptilian races, the Sikar, uh, even some of the Anunnaki, some were very, very 
nice to us and kind, and others were deplorable in their treatment of us, as if we were garbage. So, and you know, we've taken all this in, and it's all part of our genetic history. Most of this, of course, has been uh, whitewashed. It's been erased from our, our earth history that they teach us because they don't want us to know because they're very, very fearful what will happen when we know the truth of our history. We will rebel. We will self-empower ourselves and hopefully unite as a race once everybody understands what's been going on. And then, you know, we would have been in a place to tell them to leave. And if there was enough energy surrounding that command, you must leave, they would have had to have left. But, you know, it was a, a constant assault on us, you know. Right. And it's, it's, it's a generation after generation, decade after decade, millennia after millennia, you know, it's, you know, just it's ancient history up to the present day. And now we're starting to swing back to the very beginning where we are waking up, we are beginning to remember. And we're getting assistance as well from uh, star nations that are connected to us all genetically. You know, we have at least 22 different body types. Uh, some say 24. If we had the same mother and father, we wouldn't have these different body types. We would all be essentially the same, but we're not. Okay, there's there's there there are some interesting differences between all between our, our our bodies and physicality. So and that's because we have ancestry from from the stars. <clears throat> and I've been talking about this, you know, actually technically since 1991. But I didn't do the first video or anything to till 94. Um, and that video sat in a drawer somewhere, I think for four or five years, maybe even longer before uh, the, the one who did the interview, Rick, pulled it out and said, oh, you know, look at this. And he, he entered it into a UFO Congress film festival, you know, and... Uh, the rest is history, as they yeah, say. <laughs> well, mostly, I think. So, you know, and, um, but, you know, I would talk off and on here and there, you know, in between having babies and, and things like that and raising a family. So and being threatened. It was a lot different in the 90s. You know, it was very different then. It was hostile. Oh, my God, how hostile it was. You know, and the, the government was the least of your problems. It was it was the born agains. You know, it was uh, some of the other religious groups. They're like, you know, what are you talking about? It's all deep demons. And I'm just like, that can't be possible. You can't possibly actually think that everything in the universe is 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 evil, is demonic. And here we are on this planet with no idea who we are no idea of our history and a system that is absolutely so corrupt we have no idea what to do and we're taught about a god who's a forgiving loving god who will throw you into an abyss of fire forever for making a mistake and and that's your position everything else is evil too you know i i i i made attempts to have a conversation um, but I just didn't, I just didn't, you know, I was, you know, the threats and just, <laughs> you know, the things you're called, you know, I, when I did the Art Bell show back in 98 and, and, you know, unfortunately we just did the one, he said he was going to have me back, but I think he quit radio shortly after. Um, but, you know, I was called the, the bowel movement of Beelzebub. You know, I mean, just so creative. You know, it was just interesting. And I'm just like, oh, my God. You know, and uh, 
and then you know it, it just got, it got weird it just got very very weird but you know here we are today where people have a lot more people have an open mind and are willing to at least look into it you know some have already had experiences many have uh, seen the metal or they've had other experiences which they haven't shared with anybody or they know somebody who they really trust who did you know have an experience so it's it's interesting it's coming along and you know in, in instead of a view of the world like this because if that's your the view of the world um you're missing you're missing 90 percent of it of your life and and what's happening so you know everyone has to open up their perspective and in doing so you begin to one experience more two you begin to see more and three you begin to understand more and the more understanding you have the more that you understand and have an experience what happens is is that you expand your own consciousness and that's what has to happen here we have got to free ourselves from this prison without walls and that's what the earth has become you know it, it became a prison which we didn't understand for a very long time but it became a prison without walls you know we we couldn't leave the planet and most other star races are doing just that they're colonizing they're traveling they're meeting other races they're exploring they're sharing discoveries with other star nations because they're curious because they want to know more they want to understand the universe the dimensions and and we would be exactly the same way you know children today or children always would would rather learn than eat right you know and and we were all kids at one point you know i'm not aware of anyone who hatched from an egg as an adult but you know I've we were all sometimes. like that we were all <laughs> like that and you know we we we've lost that curiosity and and we desperately need it back because that's expansion you know right. it's expansion it is and as we're talking about your experience with the andromedans linda has joined us and she's asking are you saying the andromedans did abductions it no. doesn't sound like they're the type that would but no, you know everybody says that um I, you know, I, I don't, I don't in any way at all see it as an abduction. It was the, one of the most positive experiences I've ever had. Every visit with them has been a positive experience. And at any time I could have said, no, don't come back. And they would not have come back, you know, but because of the experience and because of what I've learned and, you know, I was more than happy to escape the Earth's gravitational field, because something happens to you. You, you, there's this weight that is just simply lifted off of you. All of the anger, all of the, the, the emotional pain, it just goes away. It's magical, and I don't like that word either, magical. But it is. It's like magical. You know, you, you just you feel huge you feel absolutely huge and there is a a sound a tone that when you're outside the earth's atmosphere that you can feel and and it, and it is like nothing that i've experienced down here before and i i have tried for years to find something that was comparable here but i haven't yet yeah and from my understanding um linda with the abductions i think majority of those are our government with the secret space program that's not really our alien allies that are uh, i'm sure the grays and, and 
some of the nefarious groups have done that. Um, you know, if you want to technically cling to the first pick me up, I, I don't consider it an abduction. I never did. I never did. And I still don't. Um, there was no nothing terrifying about it whatsoever. In fact, it was remarkable. Well, well Linda, you know, there are YouTube videos, alexcollier.org, if you're even interested. You can go to the very beginning and see all those things. You know, honestly, 30, 35 years I've been or more speaking, you know, and, and I hate repeating myself over and over and over again. So if you have any interest, you can go and 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 all that information's out there. So so Michael, what else you want to talk about? Well, with I, you know, I want to point out to everyone that as much as you have been doing with what we're calling disclosure now, that you were actually awarded a lifetime award for that at the GSIC last year, which I think was well earned and well deserved because, I mean, hearing what you've gone through. In from the beginning and to stick with it and not give up and to keep trying to help humanity grow I feel like I could think of nobody else that I would say deserves a lifetime award for standing up for the truth and trying to patiently help humanity wake up because it's not easy to wake up humanity. It, it is like you will, can give them all the evidence in the world. And it's like one of my uh, spiritual teachers would say in the beginning is, if you wanted to see a UFO, you could take a room of people, go see a UFO in the parking lot, and half of the people will say there's nothing in this parking lot. And everybody else is saying, how do you not see this huge ship <laughs> in the sky? And they yeah, say if their yeah. filters aren't ready for it, they won't see it. Yeah. So kudos to you for sticking well, with it and sticking to your guns. Well, thank you. I, I was um, I was honored um, by Danny Henderson and, and those there at GSEC. But, you know, there, there are many others who were they alive today would would be deserving, such as Wendell Stevens, uh, Bob Dean, um, Jordan Maxwell, uh, gosh, uh, Bill Cooper, um, Clifford Stone, any any one of them would have, and I'm uh, uh, Gabriel Green, George Green, rather, George Green, any one of them you know, is, is, is worthy of a lifetime achievement award. Uh, you know, we all kind of sort of started around that same time in the nineties, some maybe earlier than that. And, uh, but you know, they, they, they did everything that they could do because they, they realized the importance of this because it changes humanity's perspective of itself. And that is something we desperately need. We have been on a hamster wheel for thousands and thousands of years. And the harder we try, the faster the wheel turns, but we don't make up any ground. And, and that's because we have to change the way we think the way we see ourselves and understand ourselves. And we're never going to get that from government. We're never going to get that from religion. It's just not possible because those organizations were created to do containment specifically of humanity. And they've done their job very, very well. And the more we gave our power away, the more they did their containment, you know? So, you know, we're, we're all learning. I mean, every day 
in some way or another as the first day of school. I can agree with that, and you don't have to if you don't want to. No, I, I <laughs> you know me. I, you know, if I don't agree with something, I'll change the perspective and be like, "Isn't it more like this?" Or ask a question about it. And along those lines, talking about pre-planning everything, Linda brings up an interesting point that we believe when we're before we are born. We create like a list of lessons, everything we're going to learn, experience. So it's all pre, you could almost say preordained. Our life is pre-mapped and everything. So if we are to break free of this system, how do we, you know, before we're born, come in and say, okay, you know, how do we plan to say, hey, wake me up at this time. So I can help with this, this, and this versus being sucked into the abyss, so to speak, that the government and religion teaches us that we are to live for. <laughs> well, you know, I don't know whether uh, Miss Judd is right or wrong. And of course, you know, it all depends on your perspective. But if, if that's the case, then there is no randomness whatsoever. And the only, but there is randomness because that randomness would be how we respond to these situations, how we respond to incidences that happen in our life. That would have to be random. Otherwise, it would be very robotic going through all these things continuously. Where would the growth be? Um, if we knew that, hey, if I date this this person uh, or if I go on this trip, I'm going to get hurt or get killed, um, what would be the point if I knew it was all coming? There would be no randomness whatsoever. Um, so, you know, not that I want to have a contention with anybody, but um, – there's a whole lot more to it than that. If everything was absolutely scripted, where would the growth be? Why even have the experience if it's all 100% scripted? Right. And so, one of the things like she's pointing out too is I love how we've been scripted that even if we are to take a moment and go, hey, I no longer believe this. I'm going to change and go into this. That we're told it doesn't happen like a snap of a finger. That it's going to take years and years and years of time. And I'm starting to get the feeling like that's just another, like, um, I'm trying to think of the, wor the words like Brad Olson was using where they, predictive programming, that's it that we're programmed with the language of it's going to take forever to change this. It's not going to change overnight. So why even bother? And I think that's part of the predictive programming that because I feel like if we truly embrace who we are, then we should be able to change as fast or as slow as we want. Well, that, that may be so. That may be exactly what we do. But let me just give you an idea. Um, uh, Ms. Judd said something about personal transformation takes years. Let's say that you're, you were, before you came in in this carnation, you were a fifth density being, very spiritually evolved, very spiritually evolved. And then you decide to fall back into time, into the shit zone, okay, into the zoo. You're, you're now in the circus called Earth. Um, what what transformations are you wanting to get since that you left from this level here, uh, two dimensions higher than Earth, you fell in time to transform what? To become what? Or is it that your mission was to come in and help evolve humanity, whether it was just your frequency, by your good deeds, by writings, by music, by song, 
by speech, whatever it is. You know, there are many people who have come in, fallen into time to come here to try to elevate the people who are stuck here to get them to stop, listen, uh, you know, hear their own frequency. You know, there's so many different reasons. There's so many different things going on. And, you know, I've, I've shared this story about uh, a study that was done in Australia. And this was done in the 2000s. Um, people that had had near-death experiences. And what's interesting is that many of the people that had near-death experiences, some who were dead more than an hour, when they came back, they were completely different being of uh, people. They had changed. What's also interesting is that some of them had their third strand of DNA on. It had turned on when they came back from wherever they were into their body. Okay, strand the third strand of DNA was on. One gentleman who had been dead, I think almost three hours, woke up in the morgue. When they tested him, he had five or six strands turned on. And the only thing he wanted to do was to seclude himself from the rest of humanity. So something happens on the other side. And it appears that most of the time it's a positive experience. Uh, there are those who come back and say, well, I saw hell. You know, that's a bummer. That's a bummer. But, you know, every experience is different. Everybody... You know, there's no, there is a sense of randomness that still pertains to all of our experiences on earth. It can't possibly be scripted. Because our ability to develop emotion, to expand our field of emotion, is instrumental and developing and expanding and sharing compassion. Now, if everything was scripted, we'd be like zombies. You know, we would just be going through the motions, you know, not really caring. Oh, he chose to die in the street, leave him there and just keep moving. But that's not who we are. We are compassionate beings. Most of us are extremely compassionate. And we become compassionate after experiences that we ourselves have, where we've had broken hearts or lost a, a sibling or lost a parent, um, lost a, a best friend, lost a pet, you know, there's, or, you know, there's a, so many different scenarios that cause us to go within and, and cause pain and an emotional pain that when it's over, we have filled that pain, that, that experience of pain with compassion. And an empathy towards others. And, you know, healing comes from that, not only for ourselves personally, but for others. You know, when someone who's had a horrible experience sees that someone cares for them and, and wishes them well and will do anything they can to help them, you know, that can shift somebody's perspective for for the rest of their life about who they think they are, especially their own self-worth. So, you know, there's so many different things going on here that I don't know, you know, there is no one size fits all. It's just, it's just not happening uh, on this planet. You Frank, know, do you think that's why um, we have like some say you need the rainbow body? Some say you just need to cleanse within and you can ascend. That there's no one person that says, hey, this is the right way because we are so different. That there is not one size fits all. That's why there's all these 
people who claim to know their way to ascension and they're all different? Uh, I don't think there's just one way. I do not. Um, I think there's multiple ways to ascend. Um, and it could be that before we come in, we have an idea of how we want that to occur. It could also be that we set up unconsciously certain scenarios in our life to make that opportunity present itself. And then in that moment, we get to use our free will and make a choice. You know, am I ready to do this or do I stay? Do I stay and raise my children or do I do I ascend and leave earth um, or whatever the, the particular scenario is there? You know, earth, earth clearly was meant to be a school. And. It's it's an incredibly beautiful place with some of the highest frequencies that anyone can experience in third or lower fourth, okay? Or even maybe, you know, to some degree, fourth density. And then at the same time, it can, it can hold such darkness. The contrast is extraordinary between the polarities. And many of us dabble into the darkness before we head to the light. You know, I mean, some of the old sages of of, the, of of ancient times say, you know, you can't know the light unless you know the dark, and you can't know the dark unless you know the light. So, I mean, you know, that makes that does make sense. It does make sense because you're presented with choices, and those choices are all based on. Um, contrast. Maybe one of the biggest experiences that we have on this planet is we learn what we don't want before we can create what it is we do want. Because once you're crystal clear about what it is you don't want, then you focus all your energy away from what you don't want and you entirely devote yourself to what you do want. Or does it just find you randomly? You know, right. you know, is it, do you just bump into success overnight? You know, do you just bump into it? You know, like you would a shopping cart? Uh, you know, how's that work? You know, do you just bump into the love of your life? You know, how does that work when so many people search their whole life looking for the love of their life? Or is it that they don't really know what they want, which is why they keep searching? There's all these different scenarios and ways to look at life. Um, and, you know, what we all have to realize is, yes, it's an experience. Yes, we grow. Yes, we temper the steel. We earn our stretch marks. You know, um, we, we grow with such depth. But in order for us to truly have the genuine experience, there has to be some randomness to it. Because along with choosing what you want or deciding what it is you want, you also have to, you have to make decisions. And many of those decisions are, how do I react to this scenario? Do I, do I react with anger? Do I become a victim? Do I give up and I surrender to it? Or do I take a step back and say, you know what? I don't want this. And then you proceed to make changes mentally or physically or spiritually to move in an entirely different direction. And sometimes it's necessary to clean up a mess of decisions that you've made before you can actually turn that corner and create what it is that you want. There's all these different scenarios. Now, if we were just left to ourselves and our vices and our 
in our mistakes and our positive decisions. That would have been one thing, but we weren't. You know, we were we were manipulated. We were cornered into created belief systems that not only limited how we could think, but how we could behave, how we could act, what we could learn. Because, you know, there's, and you know, Brad Olson, you, you know, he's the perfect guy to talk to about this, all the suppressed history of, of earth and, and our civilizations that have been here. You know, why was that all hidden from us? Why did they, they hide the teachings and the knowledge that the ancients had? What happened to all the suppressed technology? Why is it that we have to keep starting over and over and over all the time? Because that's a manipulation. Okay, the, the law of consistency, which the Andromedans experienced themselves, that was completely taken out of the equation. And then we would be recycled uh, in the reincarnational cycle and every time we'd come in, we'd have the mind wipe. Again, we'd have to learn how to ride a bike again. We'd have to learn how to swim again. We'd have to learn how to use a fork, you know, how to not spill your milk, all this stuff, how to, how to get potty trained, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. You know, all of that was to burn time burn our energy and keep us focused on just survival. That's all it was. That's all it was. So I'm wondering because I'm hearing what you're saying and it makes sense. But then I look at like the matrix movies where they say like when something's been changed, there forms a glitch and we call it deja vu. Is that, could that be something to where, like you're saying, we've done it so many times that the soul is remembered and it's saying, look, I know we have to do this process, but let me give you a little bit of a head start and remind you we've done this part. So let's skip ahead to the next part. Could that be what deja vu truly is for us of, going through an experience and saying, wait a minute, I've done this before. Many people see it that way. Many people have experienced it in just that way. Um, other people, they're like, you know, I've been here before. And is it precognition? You know, because when we, when we sleep, when we go to sleep at night, Many times the soul will leave the physical body and the soul can travel forwards or backwards in time, a limited space, but the soul has the ability to do it. Now, when you dream in color, that means that your body, you're traveling, your soul is traveling. When you dream in black and white, that is you're staying in the body and it's your subconscious, either playing things out or running old tapes or um, genetic memories. So, you know, you could ask that question to so many people, what, what does deja vu mean to you? And, and you know, you'd, you'd probably get a lot of different answers. I think what's interesting, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go in another direction just for a minute. I think it's interesting that many, 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 many lifetimes, we, we always, we tend to have the same people in our lifetimes, the same souls, okay? They, they may, they have, they may have, um, you know, take a different form, be a, a different sex, uh, tall, a different race. But, you know, we come in with soul groups. And those soul groups, we, we tend to stick together with those in our soul groups because we know each other, we trust each other um, to give us or to help us have an experience, whatever that experience is. is. 
but at the same time, they're having their own experiences, which is why some people stick around for a lifetime and others for a weekend, for months, maybe a few years, and then they move on, you know? Um, it could very well be that some of those people coming into our life trigger those memories, those what you refer to as deja vus. Um, I remember as a kid with my brother Rick, um, both he and I would have those deja vus. We would, we would, you know, take a drive. When I first gotten my license, we would go take a drive. Just, just to drive, just to get away from the house. And we would just go up the Merritt Parkway, uh, I-95, or take 684 uh, to upstate New York. And, you know, he turned and goes, have we been here before? And I go, looks familiar, doesn't it? He goes, yeah. Have we been here before? I go, no, this is our first time on the road. So we would have these all the time. We used to have them a lot at my grandmother's house which was really interesting. It was an old Victorian house, four stories high. We used to have a lot of weird things happen there. Um, you know, some of it's explained, some of it had, wasn't. Uh, you know, but I I can't talk to Rick about these things because he's, he's on the other side. Um, I'll, I'll give you, here's another example. Of, of something that was really interesting. My Uncle Dick, my mom's uh, older brother, he lived in Alaska. He worked on the Alaskan pipeline. Uh, towards the end of his life, he was he was dying of tuberculosis. Um, this was in the in the early 90s. So they sent him home, you know, for the last few weeks. Uh, he was my Uncle Dick. And his wife, Jean, my aunt Jean, um, she did whatever she could do. But, but the last few weeks of his life, he would have blackouts. And during those blackouts, he would just, you know, where it would just come randomly. He would hit the floor or fall over on the couch or in his chair, and he'd be out for a period of time. And my aunt Jean would call the paramedics, etc. cetera. In one particular uh, blackout, When he came to, he had told my Aunt Jean that he had traveled up this light and he went into this absolutely huge, beautiful park. And in this park was his older sister, my Aunt Jean, who had crossed over. My mom, who we lost at eight to a drunk driver, was in this, in this park. And he was there and they were walking and they were talking. And they were talking about, you know, the, the family, about where he was, how he was doing. Then he was talking to my Aunt Connie, and she said, you know, I, I, when you go back because you can't stay, you, you need to, to um, you know, tell the kids this. And then my mom did the exact same thing. She told him to tell us, and it was the three of us at the time, you know, he told them that I'm very proud of them, who they've become. She goes, uh, I hear when they mention me or or they, they ask for help or pray. She said, but it was just too hard for her to come down into the energy to, to try to contact us. Well, my Uncle Dick was, was not a very spiritual guy. But my Aunt Jean told my sister Barry that he was, a, he was very much a changed man the last few weeks and that he had become the man she always wanted him to be. But he no longer had the fear of death because he realized it was more. He knew where he was, wherever the park was. He was with my mother and his older sister, uh, Connie. Okay. He was there and he knew it. He didn't have to explain it. He knew he was there because they had conversations of only things they would know together. This is just this is just part of the journey, you know. Um, whatever this experience is, whatever this lifetime is, 
especially this one where we have chosen to be part of humanity um, that is awakening to its own self, to its own soul, to, um, to its own remembrance of its own divinity, the soul, to the divinity of which it is. It, it's, you know, it's just a remarkable time. And, you know, despite the circus that we're all seeing in the shit show, I don't know of any other word for it. You know, there, there is, in fact, a purpose for all of this. And there has to be a reason all of us are here. Whatever roles we play, whatever we're, we're, we're here to learn, to take with us to the next life or the next dimension, wherever it is that we go, what we do here is obviously extremely important. Who we are, who we become, who we remember ourselves as, we will take this experience to the next levels. And what's interesting is that who we are, who we are in in our essence, changes humanity. It changes this bloodline. It changes this 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 line of the of human of humanity into something far greater. Now it's interesting that so many different star groups are here, so many different star groups that represent the genetic lineages of those on Earth. That's no accident either. So the time has come for humanity to stop hiding itself. It's time for humanity to stop giving away its power, its energy. It's, it's time for humanity to realize its strengths and its validity and its own value. How are we going to act with each other when we're not being manipulated? There's no mainstream media. There's no corruption. There's no extraterrestrial regressive influence. How is it, how are we going to react and act with each other when we're not being manipulated? Do we actually find our center do we settle in and just become, you know, loving human beings? I mean, is it possible? I, I, I think that that's something, I think that's something that all the star nations that are here want to see us do. I and agree. They, and they want to see it manifest itself organically. You know, in other words, it'd, it'd be a genuine inspiration from humanity itself. Right, because I agree because we look at, you know, you can even look at the story of the formation of the United States. You know, we were a small 13 colonies that took on one of the largest naval empires and did we win? Did we not? That's a matter of how you perceive the history. But a lot of people forget that the message there is like 1% to 2% of the population stood up to the majority and said enough is enough and did institute a change. And... Yes, we did. You know, they do say that Washington at, I believe, was at Valley Forge had divine influence. Well, he was visited by the angel. Right. Yeah. And I would that's say that's a, yeah. they came after we had already established we were going to do this on our own, rise up, stand up for what we felt was right. 
whether you like the Masons or not, they did form a new nation under the thumb of a large empire. And the influence didn't come until we rose up on our own and said enough is enough. We have to change this. And I think that's where we're getting to now is, you know, we keep saying, why don't the benevolent races come in? It's because they're waiting for us again to rise up and say enough is enough. Start the change. Then they'll come in like they did in the past and help us. But until we stand up and say, we're no longer going to take the, what is it in the matrix, the red pill and wake up and be, you know, just everything wiped away and start anew as a battery. We're going to keep taking the blue pill and going, let's see how far this rabbit hole goes. That's what I think they're waiting for. Well, you know, the, uh, Life under monarchies was very, very tough. People didn't have any rights. People weren't individuals. They were servants. They were subordinates. They were property. They were a resource. And I think that there was so much distress that the consciousness of humanity somehow, some way, what came out of all of that longing to be recognized, to be shown they had value, came the Magna Carta. And then out of that, the Magna Carta inspired many other people from around the world. And out of that manifestation came the Declaration of Independence. And then what we know today as the Constitution of the United States with a Bill of Rights. Now, yes, we did fight the war. We did fight the battle. But the war has always been here. This is, this is the true battleground. This is where it's the battleground has always been, is in the minds of men and women. And many of us haven't didn't recognize that. We... If we had, we never would have fallen for all the manipulations or all the fear tactics. Right. Uh, we would have fought back had we even recognized those tactics, but many people didn't. You know, they, they simply didn't. Um, I mean, they, they put their faith in God. They prayed. They put their faith in Christ. And, you know, many very wonderful, positive things happened uh, along those ways. But this is still the battleground, the mind, even to this day. You know, this is still where the battleground is. And until we figure it out and we're able to truly see the game, who it is, and how they've been manipulating us, until a majority of the people see that, this is where the battleground's going to continue to be. Um, if they lose their ability to manipulate our minds, our belief systems, it's over. It'll end just like that. Right. Literally. Just that quick. It'll be gone and over with. Now, I'm noticing we're at we're like three minutes over the hour mark. Are you okay to keep going a little bit longer, or do you have yeah, to go? Yeah, we have people saying goodnight, so I'm probably boring them, and, and I apologize for that. Well, actually, we yeah. have audience from the U.K., Japan, so they're in Most different time zones. So it's they're the night in the UK, isn't it? It's about it's now would be three a.m. in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, um, okay. one question I have for you, and I, I'm going to phrase it in a way that is how my mind makes it is. We're talking about disclosure and how Hollywood has manipulated us. And now there's elements of Hollywood that are helping us to see our true potential. When I look at the movie Patriot, there's that Mel Gibson did about the war. 
there is one line that's always resonated with me and I think kind of goes along with what you were just saying about the monarchy and life under it is when the general was forced to surrender and he said, how did it come to this? An army of rabble has just taken the field. What is going to happen to us now? And it's like, I hear that and it's, it kind of like popped in my head when you were describing that. And it was like, yeah, you know, this was an army of farmers, peasants, merchants. They're yeah, not trained. trained. Yeah. Leather, leather workers. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, well, it just goes to show you what we're capable of. Yeah. When there is a when there is a movement of energy that is moved by inspired thought and a vision, there's no way it doesn't come about if we don't give up. If we continue to move towards it, what it is that we want, we will achieve it. We will, in fact, achieve it. Like you said, the, the American Revolution, it was between 5 and 10% of the population in the end. That's it. You know, yeah. most people sat by and sat back and the summer soldiers that Tom Paine talked about. These are the times that try men's souls, you know, unless you're just a summer soldier. You know, you're there towards the end when, when there's no need to give up anything, you know, or to, to risk anything. Then suddenly you join the cause. Um, but you know, you weren't there for the whole thing. They, they weren't at Valley Forge. They didn't walk through the snow with no shoes. They didn't deal with the starvation. Uh, they didn't deal with the frostbite. Just all the things that these men and women did in order to establish a nation that believed in the concepts and principles of sovereignty and individual liberties. There are many of us who still feel though that way, and there, there are others that just romanticize about it. They're not actually putting into motion, physical motion, anything to do about it, but they romanticize about it. They talk about it, but you know, they still do their nine to five, and they're not actually taking any steps to try to manifest that idea again in our society or around the world for that matter. Um, it, it's, it's tragic, especially when you realize that there are people here who are sabotaging their own country, sabotaging their own freedom and sovereignty for for paper with pictures on it, okay? Or some power they think that they're going to have. It's just, it, you know, Michael, there are times I just cannot wrap my head around the stupidity. I really can't. I agree, and it really hits me when you'll hear families that are like, oh, my father was... You know, our family was founding families of this and that. And I'm like, yes, but look at where you're at now. What what happened? When when did you guys decide we no longer are going to stand up for what like our ancestors did and we're just going to accept the money and be like, oh well, you know, we're founding family. We got that pride, but that's all it is. We'll, we'll take no action. It's like, I, I kind of feel sad and go, I wonder what your ancestors are thinking <laughs> now, looking down and going, boy, I'm sure glad I sacrificed all I did for them to be sitting on their butts doing nothing. They're probably turning over in their graves, you know. <laughs> Jesus, right. It's just, uh, I, I know, I know. I know. Yeah. You know, but, uh, my, my grandparents were immigrants to this country. 
from Europe. My grand my grandfather uh, came over on a had to hide at the bottom of a fishing boat, you know, to get um, into the uh, to to get he somehow on my dad's side, one of my grandfathers somehow ended up in Albania. And in order to get out of Albania, he had to hide on a fishing boat to Italy. And then once he got to Italy, where he met my grand, one of my grandmothers, then they came to the United States. And this is, you know, in the late 1800s. Um, and he, he, one of the first things he did, because he was an engineer, is he, he enlisted in the army. And he went back to Europe uh, in World War I. And in fact, he helped design and lay the tracks up for the railroad from Paris to Verdun. And that's where he was, is in Verdun. Oh, boy. And he was, he was given the French Medal of Honor before, for, you know, all of them that survived. That's where they were. That was nasty there. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, that's, and then my, my uncles were in World War II. They were all over Germany and, and France and Italy, Africa. So, you know, you know, I, I can only imagine the conversation that if I could walk into the, the Christmas Day living room where, where, and, and, and the conversations are going on in the couches or around the dinner table, you know, what that conversation would be today with all my uncles and aunts, you know, with, with, with my grandparents there as well. I, you know, I often wonder what would that conversation be? They would probably be so livid with us for letting it get this bad and not stopping it sooner. That's my guess. I agree. But on the flip side, though, I think they would be looking at you and going, wow, you took it to a measure beyond what we did. <laughs> well, maybe. Maybe. You know, I don't know that any of them were knew anything about ETs or would even go there. I don't know that. Right. So not everybody wants to go there because of the fear factor. Oh, my God, they're in starships or this. They're, you know, they have they have all this power, they have all this technology, and I'm just this, this, you know, and, and I want to hide. And, and that's not what it's about at all. Some of them are like that. You know, some of them are like that. But yeah. you know, you, you, you fight. And, and whether you win or lose, you fight, you, you honor yourself. No matter what, you honor yourself, you honor your freedom, you honor your sovereignty. You know, you do not have permission to enter my space or you will never break me. So go F yourself, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is. And, um, but to just quit, to just give up, um, there's no transformation in that. No, you know, and... I think it's kind of interesting, too, as we're, you know, talking disclosure and stuff, that Stargate came out and showed how the peasant slave people of Egypt overthrew an alien race and kicked them off the planet. And then we had the three series where we learned we had to work with the benevolence and stand up to the malevolent ones and you know that we could that we you know even though they had laser like staff weapons that fired a laser bolt and we had guns that fired little projectiles that would bounce off their armor they would still fall after enough hits but it showed that, you know, as long as we didn't give up on ourselves, that, yeah, we could get the help we needed. We could sway some of the people yeah. that we were against to join us and help us. And it's interesting, too, as they had 
you know, the Stargate series, the last one, where it was the ship at Lost in Space, and they couldn't figure out how to bring it home, that I heard that they're looking at bringing up a new Stargate series again, and it's all about how they're going to bring the ship home. And I can't help thinking the timing of how these shows came out when they did that is this a sign that we are returning to our homes and that the change has come that we're no longer going out to fight that the fight has come home and we're seeing the after effect of it that's a very interesting idea i'd have to sit with that for a little bit um we all of us are part of a much bigger family than we realize you know um you know the a's refer to the to god what we would call god is isness and in all of the extraterrestrials regardless of their technological prowess they cannot create a dimension only source can do that great spirit the holy spirit but whatever whatever term one uses you know creator and and they know this they they know that this 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 presence this whatever it is created the dimensions and as much life as we're experiencing here, somewhere on another dimension or with our own, some other part of our, our solar system, our galaxy rather, or in another galaxy altogether, there's life going on as well, or lots of life. On other dimensions right now, there's lots of other life going on. You know, starships moving back and forth rescue missions uh exploring um doing experiments terraforming maybe other other planets or moons for habitation all these things are going on right now as you and i are sitting here talking to each other and as you and i are sitting here talking to each other our solar system is full of starships and I'm not talking a little winky dinks, okay? Um, you know, th there are starships that make aircraft carriers look like prop planes. Yeah. So, you know, and they're here. They're, they're here, they're watching, they're paying attention. They're watching our chains of thoughts to find out how we're, how we're awakening, in which direction, how how has our our thought process changed as we continue to wake up? Is it moving in the proper direction? Um, are we becoming more compassionate? Are we becoming less defensive? Are we opening up our, our, our hearts to, to more compassion towards each other? They're looking at all of these things. And you know, this who we're becoming is who we have always been since the very beginning. We're just now coming into a remembrance of who we were. It's it's an amazing time. And, and, you know, a lot of us were called conspiracy theorists and a lot of other things. Well, point of fact, when it comes true, it's no longer a conspiracy. Or a theory. Or a theory. We are spoiler alert specialists now. I like That's that. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of want to take a moment because we were talking about the road trip that we had, and I feel like there was that one moment in that road trip that I think people would benefit from hearing about. And to preface it, I'm going to ask 
How did you find Mary Williamson and the Quinn seed and what benefits it has? You're talking about um, Winkowski. Or Winkowski, yeah. Yeah, it's not Marion w Williamson. Um, oh, God, what's her first name? Uh, Winkowski, uh, the ghost whisperer. Right. Um, I, ever since I was little, I was aware of spirits. Um, we lived in... Well, my grandmother's house was a very old house. And um, there was always interesting energy. It was never threatening. Uh, somebody wrote a pattern something specialist. I missed that. Right. He Because we, we were talking about being the spoil alert specialist. He yeah. says, I prefer pattern recognizing specialist. Okay. That'll work. <laughs> That'll work. Thank you, whoever you are. LP. I'm not sure who that is. Okay. Um, Marianne Wiskowski. 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 Uh, she's the ghost whisperer. The TV series was about her experiences. Um, and then, of course, because it's Hollywood, they elaborated. But it, it, it's about her. And she was a consultant uh, all those years on the show. Uh, a family member came to the house and this family member had some serious issues and we couldn't figure it out simply couldn't figure it out uh, one minute this family member was just awesome the next minute off the rails. So out of sheer desperation, um, and because there were things going on in the house that were poltergeistic a little bit, um, we reached out to her because she does readings. You know, she can read somebody's home, tell you if there's things there that are not supposed to be there, if there's a portal, um, et cetera, et cetera. Attachments, physical attachments. Anyway, so we, she did this reading and she said yes. Now, we gave her minimal information about anything. She said, and she said, you, you have a, a house guest um, from Florida. We never told her where this person came from. There was an entity attached to the car that this person drove, and the car is white. Two for two. Okay. And then she said, this entity likes your house guest. That's why he's sticking around. This person who's attached to your house guest was murdered in a motel over drugs by his girlfriend who was much older than him. This is Marianne Winkowski, okay, the ghost whisperer. She gave us the city and I did all the research and I'll be damned if she didn't, didn't nail it. A young man who went to the same high school as our house guest at the same time um, was 24, was shot in the head by his girlfriend, who was an elderly woman who lived in, in um, uh, um, near um, Pensacola something beach, Santa Rosa Beach, Santa Rosa Beach, um, which is where this house guest went to high school. So the girlfriend who shot the boy 
that went to the same high school as our house guest, she lived in, in, in this place where my house guest went to school, high school. Sure enough, uh, we got a year. She gave, she gave us a year. I looked it up. Um, there was a shooting in a hotel, a motel, of a, an a older woman who was 43, who was with a 24-year-old boy. And they got into an argument over drugs, and she shot him in the head. This was the only killing, the first killing ever in this hotel, and it was the only shooting in this little town that whole year of 20, 2018, 2019, 2018 wow. it was. And I'm just thinking, man, there's no way she could have known. She couldn't have known any of this. And she nailed it. And she's from Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, she's from Cleveland, Ohio. So she's the real deal. She is absolutely the real deal. And she said, look, um, I get these from Italy, these, these quinceans. They're, they're blessed by nuns at this convent. And they do all these for the church. They, it's a very special blessing if you wear this quincy and, and you wear it on you all the time. No spirit can attach to you or get within four feet of you, period. If you put these quinceans over the door of all the openings of your house where you go in and out, none of them could enter your home either. So the home stays clean. We do a reading with her um, at least once a year, sometimes twice. House has been clear ever since we had that reading with her because I went out and got the quinceans, you know, and we and, and, and I sage a lot every eight, nine, ten days. I sage, you know, not heavy, just enough to clear the space and we keep it clean. And uh, Merlin, Merlin has his own quincy. <laughs> Because they'll attach to anything that's living. Right. So they, because they have to feed off of it. That's the only reason they can stay in the realm. And our realm is because they have to feed off of the energy. So they attach typically to humans. So is that what you wanted to hear? <laughs> well, that's a great lead in because what the story that I was going to share was we had were driving back from Florida and the car started having troubles yeah. and we were like what is this smell all suddenly there's this smell we couldn't place and you go oh the quincy on my car i gave it to some i think you ended up giving it to somebody yes who was having a lot of trouble at the <laughs> conference and you yeah. were like my car doesn't have the protection anymore and i took mine that i had on me <laughs> off Put it on the, the windshield, rear the view mirror, mirror. Yeah. and all of a sudden the smell just disappeared and the car had no more problems. <laughs> and I was like, in that moment, I was like, I didn't feel like I had any doubt when you gave me the, told me about the quince seed and bought yeah. it. But in that moment, I was like, if there was an inkling of a doubt, that just got wiped out. <laughs> I am a firm yeah, believer yeah. in this seed. Yeah. Yeah, that was at the, the Shell Station. It was. And then, and then we went to, um, it's a place we had breakfast. Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel. That's right. Cracker Barrel. Before we mosey on, moseyed on our way through Mississippi. <laughs> yeah. So they're asking where can we buy it? Um, uh, Marianne Winkowski's website. Uh, just look up Ghost Best uh, um, Ghost Whisperer. Uh, Marianne Winkowski. Um, I think it's W I N K O W S K I Winkowski. Something that some variable like that. She'll come up. She's very popular. You know, what's interesting is that she does uh, a webinar once a month. And you have to, 
usually get into it in advance. And I, I think it's like 15 or $20. But what she'll do is she'll give your house a reading um, as long as you're in your home. And um, whoever else is in the house, she can read as well. And man, it's amazing the stuff that she gets. And you could just see people like flabbergasted that she can nail this stuff. Um, you know, because she's in Cleveland and you could and, and she you could be in Vermont. And she says, you know, do you have a dead plant in your living room in the in the north corner of the house? Yeah. You need to get rid of that. It's creating a portal and, and you're drawing negativity to the house because that's a dead plant. And, and she'll come up with this stuff. And you're like, well, how would she even know it was there? You know, because she's got the gift. She, she has the gift of vision. It's, it's truly remarkable. It really, really is. Yeah, I forgot about the car thing. I hadn't thought of that in a while. <laughs> I have a lot of life going on here re lately, so. I know, and I, I was thinking about it, too. It, like, popped in my head, and I was like, Alex is the one that recommended it with my experience that I had. And I was like, he's on the show. How can I work that in? And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I, I try not to script, you know, what's going on, but there are some moments that I'm like, yeah, I feel like the way I share the information doesn't do it yeah. quite the justice. So thank you for sharing that. And oh, you're you're welcome. Um, you know, my car. I have two quince seats, one in the rear view mirror, and one at the very back. You know, where the the the, the back door lifts up. Right. Um, so I have one each there, so nothing can get in the car. Nothing can screw with the electronics of the car either. Um, and it's amazing. Um, one of one of our one of my sons was having an issue, and you know he's not. He's like, no, Dad, come on, that, that that can't be true. And I'm like, okay, um, you know, let let me check some things in your car. And I put two quince seeds in his car. He still doesn't know they're there. He has not had any more car trouble <laughs> since I did that. <laughs> but of course, I'll never get the credit for it, you know, because he doesn't know the quince seeds are there, you right. know, because ghosts can very, very heavily manipulate electronics. Right. And of course, you're the expert. You're the resident, you know, ghoster here. So you, you know all about that. It's true. They do. And why don't you do. give us a story? Why don't you give us, give, give, give the four of us who are listening, give us, <laughs> give us a story about um, being on one of your quests and how all the electronics, the lights, Recording equipment all quit, took a dump. Well, actually, uh, uh, it's not my story, but it's a story that I think I told you some of that I think you're going to get touched by and a kick out of is two days after my dad had passed away, I was on the phone watching a live investigation at a location I had been to. And the lady that runs the investigations there was, you know, trying to get one of the spirits to activate and, you know, respond. And so she saw me pop on and she goes, hey, can you watch and, you know, let us know what happens? And I said, sure, you know, why not? So I'm watching and I start asking questions of the spirit, the little boy that's supposed to be there. And the devices start to respond. And I'm like, I'm not verbally saying this. I'm typing it on a screen. Somebody else will ask the boy something, nothing. I'll ask the question. Rempod goes off. And I'm like, this is interesting. And I'm like, because I think he knows me because I had been there once or twice before. So he was more comfortable with me. And I told her, yeah, he's, you know, being responsive and there was some activity. And she's like, okay, thanks. And so I said, well, you know, I need to try and get some sleep. I haven't slept much. So it's one o'clock. I'm going to go to sleep. Well, she has another investigation Saturday night. 
I talk to her on Sunday and say, hey, how did the weekend go? And she goes, well, we had something interesting happen around 2, 2.30 in the morning when we were breaking down on Saturday. I said, what is that? She goes, we kept getting the name Joseph, but we couldn't place it. And I'm like, I'll suddenly fully attentive and go, wait, what? <laughs> and I said, go on. And she goes, well, and then we had this one phrase come up. And because of that phrase, I had to go and do something Saturday on Sunday and I, or Saturday. And I said, I can tell you, I can take that name. And I can take that phrase and give you the answer. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, that's my dad who passed away two days ago. And she was like, oh, my God. So then she goes and tells me on Saturday night, everybody brought equipment that was freshly charged. All, and she, all her equipment, she had just charged up that afternoon. All of it failed. They could not get a single ounce. She couldn't go live. The Wi-Fi wouldn't work. All the stuff wasn't working. And I couldn't help but thinking in the back of my mind, Dad is really trying to get attention. <laughs> really, you know, having some fun with this now. But, yeah, so I've even had investigations where I will charge the day of a body camera and go... And it won't turn on. So spirits definitely love to drain batteries and mess with the electronics. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So Waza B, I'm not sure if you know who this is, is asking an interesting question. He says, Alex, can Mornay help you with spirit intervention if extreme? You know, he probably would, but uh, I don't burden him with that stuff. I try to manage everything I can myself. Um, you know, it would be very easy to let someone else take care of it. But then I wouldn't have the experience and I wouldn't have the knowledge that I have today. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm not exactly sure that they would. They probably would. But I would never sit back and let it get so bad that I would have to ask them to in the event that they would say, no, we cannot intervene in this particular thing. Then it would be up to me, but I would not want it to ever get to that level. Um, you know, plus when you have kids, you want to teach them what works and what doesn't work. And... And in order to know that, one has to actually have the experience themselves to know what works and what doesn't work. So when it comes to this, I have some experience. I, I don't have, you know, I don't, I don't have, uh, what, what's that? Um, I don't have any uh, experiences with exorcisms or anything like that, but I know people who do do exorcisms and things like that. And of course, you know, we share our, our personal databases with each other and our experiences. But I would not burden Mornay. I mean, you know, they live in another dimension, 280 million light years from here in fifth density. That's how far it is. Okay. I, I, you know, I wouldn't ask him to do something I could do myself. Seriously. I like that. And I think that speaks volumes to the human essence, the thing that, you know, our spark, so to speak, the, you know, is in us because, yeah, I mean, how can they expect us to brighten our spike, our spark and elevate ourselves if the second things get tough, we fold. They come in and go, "Oh, here, you know, yeah. here's this device that'll cure all this up." Yeah, it's yeah. like they're, well, <laughs> they're good people, but they're a card table. You know, they fold yeah. right away. 
No. Uh, you know, the whole, if, if you go and you look at their words and the message that they have always shared, it's, you know, trying to get us to, one, take back our power and stand on our own two feet, to be totally self-confident and free, to unconditionally be responsible for ourselves without being coerced by some higher authority. That's the creed for our planet. That's who they see us becoming. You know, and, and I've always taken that to heart. And, I, and I've always tried. And, you know, even where it appears that I have failed, you know, you don't give up. You just try it a different way. And eventually what happens is, is that you work it out. You get past it. And then years down the road, you can look back at it um, and appreciate the experience for what it's taught you. Because, you know, now you're further down, further upstream or, or uh, moving towards the sunset and your life is better and you have all this experience and you have a confidence about you that you've learned because of that experience, because you learned how to overcome it and move forward. Right. You can't pay for that shit. You know, you can't buy that stuff. You just have to live it. Yeah. That that reminds me of that one religious comic book strip. I'm sure you're familiar with Alex, where you have the guy that's on the rooftop in the flood and he says, God, you got to save me from this flood. And a boat comes up and he says, hey, get on the boat. We'll help you. No, God's going to save me. And then the boat leaves and a helicopter comes in and the helicopter's like, we'll drop you a rope ladder. We'll, we'll get you out. No, God's going to save me. Ends up drowning and he gets to the pearly gates and says, you know, God, I just got to ask, why did you let me die? And he goes, what did you want? I sent you a boat. I sent you a helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think that kind of fits is you know they may be helping us in little ways so that we but we are expecting it in another way and so we miss it exactly exactly that's why it's so important to sometimes just stand still just stand still no matter where you are and just know where you are and know everything that's going on around you you know, we get so focused on our tasks every day. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to be here on time. I got to be there. I, I have to do this and do that. And da, 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 da. And what happens is, is we never actually ground ourselves in the moment and take in everything that's going on around us. And we lose our way. And it's very easy to get lose our way just keep getting distracted. And before you know it, you are so off your path, you don't even know how you got there because you were so distracted doing all this other stuff. Right. And I think the other thing, too, is we have taught ourselves if we get so far off the path, there's just no way to turn around and get back on it that we're just too far gone. So let's just carry it out and it's like well that may be but there could also be a branch off up ahead that's a shortcut back onto the path but we don't think about it because we're like we already all queued up to ourselves of oh yeah i'm doomed I, i'm beyond forgiveness so yeah I went too far and none of that's true i mean uh, all the broken pieces find their way home i mean we're we're all part of source <laughs> You know, every single one of us is a part of source. Source doesn't kill itself. Source doesn't cut part of itself away and toss it into the trash. No, it would never do that. It's 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 when we find ourselves lost, that's when it's it's important to stop and ground and really take a look at where you are. And even if in that moment you decide you know what you want and you don't know how to get back, the best thing to do is to find, is to take baby steps. Just do one thing 
to help you find your way. And then once you've done that, you find you do another and then another. You don't try to do the whole thing all at once, but you take one step at a time. And when you've accomplished that, you go to the next thing and the next thing. And you solve all these little problems. And eventually you'll get to some of the larger problems. And once you tackle those, you will find yourself exactly where you need to be or where you should have been. It's just not giving up on yourself. Because if you give up on yourself, you don't give anybody else a chance to help you because you've already given up. You know, and if you don't have faith in you, who's going to have faith in you? And why would they have faith in you when you don't have any in yourself? You know? Yeah. I, I like how Nancy put it is, yeah, look at it in small pieces so as to not overwhelm yourself. Yeah. Bravo. yeah. Exactly. Well, Michael, two things. Um. Merlin's working me for a walk, and I have to use the restroom. So well, I was about to say, I, I just realized we went <laughs> over the hour and a half, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna call this an evening, all right? Yeah, let's, let's do this say, again, though. All right, definitely. I so enjoyed thank, this a lot. Yes, I did too, and thank you for coming on, and thank you to everyone in the chat room. And I do know Michael, by the way. We we do know each other. We have broken bread and. His mom and dad are very dear friends of mine, even though he just lost his dad. He's, he's still a friend of mine. So well, thank you. And you're a friend of ours as well. And um, funny story about how I will share in transparency is, you know, talking about how friends we are is I was telling Alex that I was doing this series and he kept saying to me, well, when am I going to get the come on? And I, I was like, I thought you were retired. And he's like, no. So I was like, well, then let's go. <laughs> no, I do the webinars and stuff. I'm just not doing public speaking, standing on stages. I never enjoyed that part of this at all anyway. I never did. So. Well, I do appreciate you coming on and everything and i won't keep you because i know merlin you know has his needs and you have yours and i didn't mean to keep it so long no it's but... all good it's, it's all good merlin is very strong with the force <laughs> <laughs> yes he's very strong with the force <laughs> okay so with this series a little bit of housekeeping as you know this is the second episode of this month so Stay tuned and watch the page because I will be announcing next month who is coming on for those two shows. So thank you everyone for watching and wherever you are in the world, good, have a good night, a good morning, and a good afternoon. And I will play our outro to send us out. Michael, keep ghosting, all right? I will. You too. And you keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I love to your mom. I will. All right. I want to see the last part here. Okay. <laughs>